All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Physics Meets ML. It is a great pleasure to have my friend and colleague Jesse Thaler uh, to tell us about weak supervision for the strong force. Jesse is a professor at MIT uh, and the director of IFI, our institute uh, here in the Boston area at the Interface of Physics and Machine Learning. So, Jesse, we're thrilled to have you here today. As you know, uh, people will probably ask questions throughout. Feel free to raise your hand, put them in the chat, etc. Uh, and Jesse will also take questions after. So thanks a lot. Great. Well, thanks very much, Jim. Thanks for inviting me to, uh, to Physics Meets ML. Um, and uh, let me first just uh, uh, give a shout out to uh, my co-organizers for a workshop at the Aspen Center for Physics, which is happening right now, which is very much in the spirit of, uh, of this uh, workshop, this seminar series, uh, the interplay of fundamental physics and machine learning that Constantine and, and Harrison are, are, are running with me. And then let me also uh, use this as an opportunity to advertise our Artificial Intelligence Institute, funded by the National Science Foundation, the Institute for uh, Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions, which is also in the spirit of this series, where we're trying to, in our institute, infuse physics intelligence into artificial intelligence and uh, try to develop machine learning techniques that incorporate first principles, best practices, and domain knowledge from fundamental physics. And if you're interested in learning more about what's going on in the i5 sphere, uh, I encourage you to, uh, to check out um, our summer school and workshop. Uh, we'll be having uh, a, a summer school, both in person and virtual, uh, the first week of August, and then a two day workshop covering things at this intersection uh, in the second week of August. So for this talk, what I thought I would do um, is give a talk that in some sense goes back in time and explain some of my enthusiasm for this interface between machine learning and uh, my field, which is collider physics. So I've titled the, the talk Weak Supervision for the Strong Force. Uh, so one of my areas of expertise is understanding collider physics and, uh, and strong dynamics. And um, this is in some ways an, an iFi origin story um, because five years ago, I was very skeptical about the relevance of machine learning for my field. But uh, two graduate students, Patrick Kamiski and Eric Matodiev, came to my office at MIT and they showed me this cool paper that they had written with Matt Schwartz at Harvard showing how you can use techniques from uh, computer vision uh, to tell the difference between two different types of jets, quark jets and gluon jets. And as I'll explain more in this talk, these are uh, uh, the emergent properties of the strong nuclear force. So they came into my, my office, they were explaining to me all about their neural network architecture, how they were using fully supervised learning uh, to accomplish this task. And my immediate reaction to them, which hopefully will become more clear why I was so uh, negative on this when they came to my office, was, well, what do you mean by quarks and gluons? In the context of full supervision, we have to know how our data is labeled. And at this time in 2017, I was very concerned that as theoretical physicists, I didn't have a understanding of what these fundamental degrees of freedom look like when it came to actually doing data processing. And in some sense, the story today is an answer to this question. So five years later, I finally know an answer and I can show this plot on the left-hand side, which uh, shows an interesting optimal transport-based analysis that separates things out into gluon and quark degrees of freedom. So I'll explain this talk by this plot by the end of this talk. But five years later, I finally know an answer. Uh, it's not a unique answer, but it's an answer that I can sleep well at night about. Um, and it uses various aspects of machine learning in an interesting way. And so that's why I thought this would be fun to talk about in this physics meets ML series. So we're gonna be talking about weak supervision, topic modeling, permutation invariant networks, simulation-based inference, optimal transport, some at different levels of detail than others. And I just wanna walk you through in some sense, my growing to appreciate the uh, ability to use machine learning in a fundamental physics application. And in particular, to understand this conundrum that I was facing in 2017 about what do we mean by these, uh, these quark and gluon labels. I'll then show you what our answer was um, in 2018 um, and how we can leverage weak supervision to give an answer to this question that's again, satisfying to me. And then kind of a, a, a tour through the next years of development, trying to revisit the strong force with this new knowledge in hand. And this last part is going to be going like very, very quickly. Um, and uh, please uh, stop me for any questions. Um, but I kind of want to make sure you understand the conundrum first, the way to solve it. And also think about how this might be relevant in any domain that you're working in, where labeled data sets might be difficult to come by, labeled data sets might be ambiguous. And here I want to give you an example where the labeling is really fundamentally ambiguous, which is why something like weak supervision or unsupervised learning becomes essential. Okay, let me dive right in. 
um, and uh, set the stage by giving you a little bit of a particle physics 101. Uh, so some of you may have seen this pie chart, which shows the fundamental degrees of freedom in the standard model of particle physics that goes governs all known uh, physics at the shortest distance scales uh, probed in nature. We have the quarks shown in orange. Uh, we have the leptons shown in green. We have force carriers shown in blue and the Higgs boson discovered in 2012 at the center of the standard model of particle physics. So this is the picture that we show. However, the data that we actually collect when we uh, analyze collision debris at colliders aren't these degrees of freedom. Some of these degrees of freedom we can see directly. So for example, photons, uh, muons, and electrons, these are degrees of freedom that only experience the electromagnetic force. Those are ones that we can actually see directly in our colliders. But everything else has to be inferred in some way. So for example, quarks and gluons, we don't see them directly. They uh, undergo confinement. Basically, the strong force is so strong that you can't see quarks and gluons as isolated degrees of freedom. And so instead, we see composite states. Uh, with funny Greek names like pions and kaons, also more familiar protons and neutrons. And these are confined states coming from the strong force. So when I say I want to study quarks and gluons, I can't actually study those directly. What I'm really studying is the spray of pions and kaons that come out when I produce quarks and gluons at short distances. And everything else in this pie chart also has to be inferred. So top quarks, tau leptons, Higgs bosons, W and Z bosons, they end up decaying relatively quickly. So you only infer them from their debris products. And the neutrinos are ones that basically sail through your detector and you can't see them. So it's a very challenging inference problem to take the spray of radiation that you see in your collider and figure out the dynamics that undergoes uh, the fundamental physics. So let me show this same thing in, in movie form. Uh, so this is an outreach movie made from the, uh, the Atlas experiment at the Large Hadron Collider, showing the sequential acceleration of protons around the uh, CERN complex. So right now, uh, the protons are being injected into the SPS where the W and Z bosons were discovered in the 1980s. Those are being injected into the larger Large Hadron Collider with four primary collision points, CMS, ELISE, ATLAS, and LHCB. We're going 100 meters underground. The standard model of particle physics is in graffiti on the wall here. These blue tubes are superconducting magnets. We're gonna soon cross the Swiss-French border. And then when I go inside this beam pipe, we're gonna see this proton, which again is this bound state of the fundamental degrees of freedom, quarks and gluons, but bound into this composite state. This again is an outreach video from the Atlas experiment. So we're going to be colliding into the Atlas detector, this giant uh, detector, basically a camera that's going to be able to sense the collision debris. And at this precise moment in time, the degrees of freedom that are governing the strong force are Quarks and gluons. These are degrees of freedom that I can do calculations for in quantum field theory. This is kind of the bread and butter of the research that I do. And it would be amazing if I could actually take a picture of this collision process at this instant in time where the degrees of freedom are quarks and gluons. But that's not what I see. What I see are sprays of radiation coming from that collision point. Those white lines are charged particles. The gray, uh, so the green and orange yellow blobs are uh, calorimeter deposits. And then rotating into view are these collimated sprays represented by these white cones, these jets, these collimated sprays of particles that started off their life as quarks and gluons, but then gave rise to the sprays. And there was no way unambiguously to go back and figure out from the spray, did I make a quark? Did I make a gluon? What was the degree of freedom that was actually present in that collision process? And this issue of like, what is a quark jet? What is a gluon jet? Uh, which is kind of central if you ever want to do something like fully supervised learning. In 2017, I worked with a study group at the uh, at Les Uches where we debated endlessly uh, over lunches and dinners about what is a quark jet versus a gluon jet. Uh, for those of you who know about the strong interactions, uh, the strong force is described by an SU3 gauge theory. Quarks are color triplet degrees of freedom. Gluons are color octet degrees of freedom. But the only thing that I actually see in my detector are color singlet hadrons. So just in terms of uh, symmetry structures, there really is no unambiguous way of mapping a spray of color singlet hadrons into a quark or gluon label in an unambiguous way. And uh, as part of this 2017 study, uh, we made this chart talking about like various levels of defining uh, of things, going from the most ill-defined to the most well-defined. And um, the reason why uh, the, the paper that uh, Patrick and Eric uh, showed me back in 2017 uh, got under my skin so much is that the label that they were using for doing their sample was this kind of third tier down, the initiating quark parton in a final state shower. That's what they were using um, with generating the training data sets to apply their uh, fully supervised learning. And I said, well, geez, that's pretty high up on the ill-defined this scale. 
And the most well-defined definition that we could come up with in 2017 is this giant mouthful highlighted in green here. And this was the best definition that we could come up with in 2017 for what a quark and a gluon was. A phase space region as defined by an unambiguous hadronic fiducial cross-section measurement that yields an enriched sample of quarks as interpreted by some suitable but fundamentally ambiguous criteria. That is a, uh, a mouthful. And what is absolutely remarkable to me is that machine learning, in particular weak supervision, provides a definition of this green box such that you really can define quarks and gluons in this way that as far as I as a quantum field theorist am concerned is actually well-defined. And I do not know how to do this technique without machine learning. And so we put this green box in there and like as a goal for what we wanted to accomplish. And it's kind of surprising that machine learning actually pr provides a toolkit to actually achieve that more well-defined notion of what we mean by uh, this labeling of quark and gluon. So let me just go through one more time just to emphasize this challenge. I wanna make sure that there's no confusion about the problem that we're trying to solve here. So I slam together protons at colliders like the LHC. I'm trying to look for uh, you know, possible physics beyond the standard model, or maybe for the purposes of this talk, I just want to understand the strong force, uh, that is the force governing the interactions of quarks and gluons. And we know from first principles how quarks and gluons behave. In particular, this collimated spray of radiation that you get is described by uh, something that's called the ultra Crazy splitting kernel. It's a core prediction of quantum chromodynamics. That's the quantum field theory that describes the strong force. And it says that if I have a quark or gluon that's made with high energy, it radiates additional gluons proportional to the charge, the color charge of those objects. So if you have uh, a, an electromagnetic charged object that radiates photons, that's maybe more familiar to some of you. If I have a color charged object or something that experiences the strong force that radiates gluons, those gluons themselves can radiate. And you get this kind of fascinating fractal tree-like structure of radiation coming out. But the core prediction is the splitting of one parton becoming two, a quark emitting a gluon or a gluon emitting another gluon. And it's governed by this splitting kernel, which you're going to see repeatedly in this talk. And for the purpose of this talk, but just more generally, quarks and gluons are distinguished primarily by their color charge. So one of the ways of saying, how do I distinguish a quark versus a gluon is, can I tell whether a given radiation pattern was produced with something that had four thirds charge, that would be for a quark, or three charge, that would be for a gluon. Um, the splitting kernel depends on various things. It depends on numbers like two and pi. It depends on the strength of the strong interaction, which is uh, governed by this constant alpha s. Uh, it's described as this color charge. And then radiation um, uh, is produced at small angles. So there's this collinear divergence that says that radiation wants to be happening when this angle goes to zero. So that's why jets are collimated. And then it also happens to be that radiation wants to be small. Uh, so it wants to be soft rather. And we're gonna see these softness and collinears uh, showing up in various different types of machine learned representations in this talk. Okay, quarks and gluons are distinguished by their color charge, but that's not what I get to see. The strong force binds it all together eventually. I get these composite hadrons. It gets even worse than that. I have to go through a detector. All the underlying information about color, the quarkness and gluon, this is lost. And while it is true that I can do precision theoretical calculations of the flow of energy from the collision point off to infinity, and I have some backup slides for people who are interested in understanding more about this energy flow operator and how it relates to jet physics. This energy flow operator, it's robust hadronization, robust to detector effects. I can compute it in first principles, but it's blind to direct quark and gluon information. So when I'm doing a theory calculation, how do I interpret my theory calculations in terms of the underlying degrees of freedom given this ambiguity? This is what I was obsessed with in 2017. That's what I want to try to resolve today. As a side note, another thing that was happening in 2017 is that I got really excited about the use of public collider data. So the CMS experiment at the LHC, that's the experiment on the opposite side of the ring from that movie that I showed before. They release public data uh, in an open data format for use by anyone without restrictions. And I got excited about, hey, could I stress test some ideas that I was working on? Could I stress test that on this open data? And um, we developed a colorblind test of QCD, one that was insensitive to quark gluon composition and sensitive only to this soft singularity structure. So this one over Z here is actually mimicked by this histogram here that shows this one over Z behavior. And there's a whole other talk that I could give to uh, explain what this is. But I got excited by public data. I got excited by trying to use this to probe elements of the strong interaction. And I was frustrated in this particular analysis that we were going the opposite direction. I can't see quarks and gluons, rather I'm seeing something that's insensitive to it. Can we go the other, other way around? So to summarize this preamble, 
Jets are manifestations of quarks and gluons. The physics of it is very well understood. We, in fact, have incredible generative models that can generate these sprays of radiation using quarks and gluons as, as ingredients in those generative models. But there's no unambiguous way to tell a quark jet from a gluon jet individually. And that's why I did not believe that any fully supervised quark gluon tagging, or for that matter, any type of jet analysis that used fully supervised learning uh, could be trusted because it was fundamentally ambiguous. And by the way, I still believe that. I still believe that, that full supervision is something that is, is uh, quite challenging to apply in the collider world. And so I'm an advocate more for unsupervised or weakly supervised methods. What I wanna show you now is what happened in 2018 uh, to make me convinced that at least there was something one could still do uh, from a machine learning perspective. Okay, so let me just pause for a moment to get a drink of water. And if there's any questions at this point, uh, let me know. Okay, so um, now I wanna talk about uh, leveraging weak supervision and then explain what this cute koala is doing uh, reading a textbook. So this problem that we face, that you're given an example and you don't know whether that example came from one category or another category, this is seen in many other areas of science. Um, and one of the areas where I learned about this was in the context of cosmology. So some of you may have seen this beautiful baby picture from the Big Bang of the universe, where we see these little fluctuations that are coming from quantum fluctuations in the early universe. And we could imagine that we point a telescope at the sky and we see this beautiful picture directly. But that's not actually what happens. What happens in cosmology is you take multiple pictures of the sky. Most of those pictures are contaminated by the fact that we live in a galaxy. So you see the galactic plane of the Milky Way. You take pictures at multiple different frequencies and then somehow miraculously through some data science techniques, you're able to get this picture of the sky that's uncontaminated by, um, by the uh, galactic plane. So how is that possible? So the generic name for this is, is blind source separation. And what this basically means is I have a detector, or in this case, a, a telescope. It sees a photon. It does not know whether that photon came from the cosmic microwave background. That's what I want to see. Or maybe it came from detector noise, or maybe it came from galactic contamination, or maybe it came from clusters or galaxies that were glowing. We don't know where any individual photon is coming from. But if I take enough pictures where the composition of these various components changes, and in particular, if I take pictures at different frequencies, um, I end up getting different compositions of these. I can do a kind of clever linear algebra problem to undo that contamination and decontaminate things and pull out the individual components. So again, this is known as blind source separation of which there's a variety of techniques that one could use. So you can ask the question, could I do that same blind source separation? Could I do it in the context of quark and gluon jets? With the idea being that while you can't unambiguously label individual jets as being a quark or a gluon, you can nevertheless extract the quark and gluon distributions from measurements of these color singlet hadrons. So in natural language processing, this is known as topic modeling. And it comes from the idea that you can represent uh, text as some bag of words that you draw from different topics. So you can have the quark topic and each of these histogram bins represents a word that I could grab out of that, uh, out of that topic. This is the gluon topic, I can grab a word out of that. And then when I form a histogram from some mixed sample, so I have some sample of jets, it's as if I'm writing a, a, a document where I'm grabbing words from these various different buckets. And in the context of topic modeling, if I have enough of these documents, and if I have some information about the number of categories that I'm looking for, I can again do this decomposition, this, this uh, uh, demixing uh, to be able to take these documents and uh, push them back into what their underlying distributions were. And when I first learned about this, I thought that this was somehow magical um, and, uh, and the fact that this was even possible. And I was a, a bit skeptical that this was something that would be uh, well-defined in, uh, in a quantum field theory context, but this is essentially what we're, what we're able to do. And what we're replacing the ambiguity in quark and gluon labels with, we're replacing that ambiguity with an assumption. This assumption is subject to corrections, um, but under this assumption, this fundamental assumption, the technique that I'll tell you about works. So the assumption is that one can make jet samples that are mixtures of quarks and gluons. Well, I just told you jets come from quarks and gluons, so that seems kind of obvious that of course I can make samples that are mixtures. So, so I'll have to explain a little bit more what I mean by that. So what I mean by that is that I can make a mixed sample here where this X represents all different jet features. It could be like the number of particles in the jet, how many are charged, how many are neutral. It could be how much energy carries, what its mass might be. Those are all properties of the jet. 
And to say that I can make a jet sample, it says that with some probability FQ or some fraction FQ, I am drawing from the probability distribution of quarks. And then with the probability one minus FQ, I'm drawing from the probability distribution of gluons. And that this, pro this process of making this mixture doesn't actually affect the underlying quark and gluon distributions. That is, I'm not biasing things such that I'm making a jet sample that's only, part of, only jets that have, let's say, three charged particles in it. That would bias the quark and gluon uh, selection. I want to have something where all I'm doing is changing the fraction of quarks and gluons, but the properties of the quarks and gluons are unchanged. So can this be done? And the answer is to a good approximation, it can. So this is a side view of a collider. The beams are coming in from the left and coming to the right. You see these red sprays, this is jets. And it turns out that if I look at, for example, jets that go in the relatively forward part of the detector, those jets to a good approximation can be described as a mixture of quarks and gluons. That is this selection doesn't bias the properties of the quarks and gluons, just changes the relative fractions of them. Uh, that turns out to be quark enriched. And if I look at jets that are coming into the central part of my detector, uh, those can be thought of as a, a mixture of quarks and gluons, a bit more gluon enriched. And again, this ability to do this is non-trivial. This assumes that these mixtures A and B have unbiased jet properties. So if you were thinking about doing this in the context of a, of a, of a, you know, a, a, a population study, uh, you would want to say, look, I want to have the number of people who are cat lovers and the number of people who are dog lovers. I want to change the cat dog composition, but all the dog lovers, I want them to always be the same. They have all the same other properties in terms of that's a hairstyle or clothing style or the movies they like to watch. And all I'm doing is looking at different places for the different fraction of cat and dog lovers. That seems very challenging to do um, in, uh, in a population study, but it turns out that yes, in a uh, context of quantum field theory, it is possible to make selections that don't bias the properties of quarks and gluons, just change their fractions. So assuming you can do this, then the fundamental trick, um, which uh, is, is uh, due to uh, Kat Samuels, Blanchard and Scott, is that you can reverse this process. If someone gives you mixtures A and B, you can use this to define what you mean by quarks and gluons. And this seems kind of crazy. Someone gives you mixtures and you'd say, well, I could take any linear combination of those mixtures and that would just give me another mixture. How could I use these mixed samples to define pure samples? And the answer is that you can do that linear combination, but do the extreme version of that linear combination. Do the extreme combination where you take distribution A, subtract off some part of distribution B, normalize it, and keep pushing this kappa factor as far as you can go until that probability distribution stops being a probability distribution. So what do I mean by that? Eventually, if you subtract off too much, if you have two probability densities and you subtract one from the other, eventually you're going to get something that goes negative. And we know that there can't be a negative probability. So at that point you stop and you say, that's what I'm going to define as quark. You can do the same, way with gluon, you basically take the B distribution, subtract off as much of the A as possible. Um, and uh, that defines what gluons are. And uh, uh, this, this 2016 paper actually shows you how you can do this with multiple samples. Basically you push these kappas, roughly speaking, as big as possible. Uh, and uh, you end up with distributions that are what are called mutually irreducible. That is one distribution can't be uh, written as a linear combination of the others. And from those categories, you actually use this to define in an operational way what quarks and gluons are. So in 2018, uh, uh, Eric Patrick and I advocated for this strategy for um, defining quarks and gluons. Uh, the ATLAS experiment at the LHC actually did this. So exactly what I showed in the previous slide they did. They took jets that were forward, made in the, the, the forward part of the experiment, jets that were central, made in the central part of the experiment, in this particular case, they're just counting the number of charged particles that are produced in those jets, some number between zero and 60. So when I take a forward jet, sometimes it's 10 particles, sometimes it's 30, sometimes it's 50. Take a central jet, same thing, they're overlapping. And then I apply this demixing algorithm to get out topic one and topic two, the maximally separated uh, components, which turn out to correspond quite well to what you would get from a first principles understanding of what quarks and gluons are. Um, this was done, this was successful, but then there was a complaint, which is, wait a second, you had to decide what aspects of this jet to study. You could do this decomposition, but it seems like there's yet another ambiguity. Don't these jet topics 
don't they depend on the choice of jet features? And aren't you just taking in this ambiguity and just shifting this ambiguity around? Again, the way that we resolve the ambiguity from what do I mean by mixtures is just to take the extremes. So that was one way of resolving the ambiguity is to take an extreme case. The question is, can we do the same thing here? Could we choose jet features in the extreme way and use that as a way of defining quarks and gluons in a way that doesn't reference a human choice about what observable to study? And that's where this cute koala comes in. <laughs> Yes, it is true that the jet topics depend on the choice of jet features. That's absolutely the case. But it's possible to find maximum separability by leveraging weak supervision. The particular technique uh, that we're using uh, uh, is one that I developed with, uh, with Eric and uh, Ben Nachman called Koala, which stands for classification without labels. That's the, the cute koala. And then reading the book is the fact that they're doing topic modeling with this koala uh, uh, derived uh, object. And for those of you who, who, who are experts, uh, we called it classification without labels. Strictly speaking, this is classification with very noisy labels, um, but uh, Koala was a cuter acronym, uh, so which is why we stuck with it. So let me try to explain uh, this to you. So we're used to doing binary classification in the fully supervised case. If I have pure, perfectly labeled examples, um, this is something we all know and love. You can define signals as being label one, backgrounds as being label zero. You can train a classifier, for example, with the MSE loss or, or some other uh, appropriate loss function. And if you minimize that loss, if you had infinite training data, um, infinitely flexible models um, and uh, no uncertainties to worry about, then the classifier that you would uh, pick up would be a function of the likelihood ratio of the signal compared to the background. And this is the optimal classifier according to the name of Pearson Lemma. This is well known, well understood. Um, and just to remind you how this goes, if I'm in a region of phase space where my jet feature is never exhibited by the background, then I get one. I'm fully confident that this is a signal. If I'm in a region of phase space where um, that jet feature is never represented in signal, then this function goes to zero. So it's some number that goes between zero and one, interpolating as best you can between the signal and background. Classification without labels is the identical mathematics only <laughs> applied to these mixed samples. So you just train on these, 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 these mixed samples. And the mixed classifier, which depends on these mixed samples A and B, is not the same as the pure classifier, for example, if I were doing pure quark gluon uh, discrimination. And so you might say, well, I can do this classification. I haven't learned anything. But the amazing fact is that if you can convince yourself that these samples A and B were produced in an unbiased way, that is, you don't bias the features when you're doing this separation into, category, into, uh, into samples A and B, then it turns out that the mixed classifier is a monotonic function of the pure classifier, which means that this weak supervision, which is using basically contaminated labels, will yield the same decision boundaries as strong super supervision. And therefore, you're defining the optimal separation, not only between mixed categories A and B, but also the pure categories, in this case of quark and gluon. And so now, assuming that you're able to do this machine learning training, you can have weak supervision meeting topic modeling. So here is the output from a particular classifier that's trying to tell the difference between two particular jet configurations for experts as die jet configurations versus Z plus jet configurations. These ones basically give me jets that are mixtures of quarks and gluons. And if I had pure quark and gluon categories, then my output would be between zero and one. But because I don't have pure quark and gluon categories, because I have something that's fundamentally mixed, the classifier can only do so well. There's an intrinsic overlap. But then using this topic modeling procedure, I can just undo that overlap, essentially in cartoon form, solve for the edges of the, the, the classifier output. And that tells me the fractions of quarks and gluons that I have in my sample. So now if I have some distribution in purple from one sample, in pink from another sample, I can do this demixing and then figure out what are the distributions um, in these mutually irreducible topics, which again, correspond incredibly well to our theoretical understanding of quarks and gluons. And so just to emphasize, this is fully data-driven. Um, I'm not using any simulation to do this. I'm just training directly on data. I can train directly on data. I can define two categories. And the two categories that I get from this procedure turn out to map onto my theoretical understanding of what quarks and gluons are. And so simply by this assumption, by assuming that jet samples are mixtures of quarks and gluons, these two categories, of course, you could generalize it more in order to have more categories and that would also work in principle. One can operationally define the categories to begin with. So it seems a little bit self-referential. It seems like this shouldn't work. 
in fact, it does work. And this now, to my knowledge, is the most rigorous definition that I have for what a quark or a gluon object is um, in the context of collider physics. So now with this, this is now back to, to 2018. Now I can fast forward to today. And so apologies that this last part of my talk might go a little bit quickly. But talking about ways that now with this insight, we can revisit the strong force. And I'm, I'm starting this timeline at 2019, because at 2019 is when I finally had my kind of revelation after going through this work. It's like, oh, wait a second. Maybe there actually is something to this intersection of, of, of physics and machine learning. And uh, uh, for me, that, that timeline uh, started uh, at a workshop at the Aspen Center for Physics uh, called Theoretical Physics for Machine Learning in January of 2019. And I gave a talk there about collisions, collisions not only at the LHC where I slammed together protons, make these sprays of particles called jets and understanding their properties and understanding the strong force, but also a collision between fields. Uh, my field of theoretical high energy physics, and then the more general fields of mathematics, statistics, and computer science, and gaining new insights into particle physics facilitated by advancing uh, advances in machine learning. And it's of course not just particle physics, as the series know, it's other you know, areas of, uh, of physics as well. And it's also not just machine learning, there's other areas of, of mathematics, statistics, computer science, data science that have had a lot of uh, influence uh, in our fields. But finally, appreciating that this is actually a principled way of gaining access to uh, uh, answers to questions that I don't know how to answer through traditional means. So um, at this point, I now need to somehow get you from 2019 to, to today. So uh, uh, the only way I know how to do that is, is to, to cue the montage. So please stop me if there's something that you want to hear more about. But I'm just going to go rapid fire through uh, various developments that, that happened to my group. Um, one of those developments was from this intersection was realizing that I can do point cloud learning. So a lot of the techniques that were being developed for understanding these jets were based on computer vision techniques. Um, point clouds uh, were coming more from the 3D modeling community. And that's in some sense, a, a, a more faithful representation of the jet information. Uh, and so uh, borrowing a technique from Carnegie Mellon group called deep sets and fusing it with some uh, insights from uh, quantum field theory, we uh, developed a set based architecture with an interpretable latent space and the psychedelic image on the left hand side is that interpretable latent space. And what do I mean by it being interpretable. What I mean is that this latent space, which was discovered by this, um, by training this algorithm on the, the, uh, the problem of quark gluon separation. Uh, happens to exhibit the collinear singularity structure of QCD. So the, the machine figured out by itself to have more attention paid to the center of this image, which corresponds to the center of my jets, less attention paid to the, um, to the uh, periphery. And it did it in a way that was exactly in line with the scaling expectations of, of QCD. So again, this machine learning architecture didn't know this ahead of time. It knew something else, a property called infrared and collinear safety but it learned this collinear singularity structure, which again, gives me confidence that the machine is learning something sensible about the problems I have in mind. Another collision happened in 2019 uh, that was uh, colliding uh, the, the field of optimal transport um, and using that to define collider geometry. So we can view our jets as if they were deposits of energy on a, uh, in my calorimeter or as mounds of dirt that I can manipulate using techniques from computer vision, the uh, earth movers distance. We adapted that to the energy movers distance, moving energy around and using this as a way to quantify how similar different jet configurations were. Once you have a notion of similarity, you can define uh, a geometry by triangulating your space of, of, uh, of jets. And then from that collider geometry, you can now study all sorts of fascinating emergent phenomena. Um, so we have uh, this collider, event or, or a jet, I then summarize that as a single point in the space. I triangulate all these pairwise distances. I then use that to define manifolds and, and objects and other types of data science uh, projections. And one of the things that we did is say, oh, I wonder what jets in general look like on this open data. So in 2020 with, uh, with Patrick, Eric um, and two uh, MIT students, uh, Prakshan Nayak and Radha Misandria, we uh, took this triangulated space using this optimal transport and then projected it down into something that you show on a slide, a two-dimensional projection, just to see, hey, what did this optimal transport way of projecting our data, what does that actually look like in terms of the fundamental degrees of freedom? And when you look at this to begin with, you say, well, all I see is a gray blob. So this is 30,000 jets where the pairwise distance as determined by this optimal transport technique 
are uh, as faithfully as you can uh, preserved in, uh, in, in 2D. And then these 25 circles are example jets that come from just picking up jets uh, in, uh, in that sample of 30,000 in a way that's representative of the um, underlying distribution. The size of these jets corresponds to how many um, uh, jets that one jet is representing. So a smaller circle means that it's basically serving as a proxy for a smaller number of jets. These large ones say I'm a proxy for a larger number of jets. And then the radiation pattern, if you kind of stare at this long enough, you realize, wait, these jets being organized in this 2D projection are actually being organized the way that a QCD theorist would organize them. Where if I go from left to right, they're organized by having strong collimation uh, versus having a wider uh, radiation pattern. That's the uh, theta angle of QCD. And from bottom to top, we go from uh, asymmetric to symmetric sharing of the energy. That's this momentum sharing variable in QCD. And it's really remarkable that this projection of this higher dimensional space uh, uh, gives you something that corresponds to anything that has to do with QCD. In fact, it kind of machine learned the right coordinate system uh, to describe these, um, these events. A plot that I'm gonna be showing later is um, the fact that once you triangulate the space, you can now define the dimensionality of that space. And this is a dimensionality that depends on scale. So um, what you're seeing here is you're seeing a plot of how many effective degrees of freedom do I need to describe my data set if I probe it with different scales. In this case, the scale is how much uh, energy I need to do to rearrange one collider event into another one. It's kind of this optimal transport based notion of, of, um, of, of a distance. And if I'm at high uh, energies or large distances, what I see in my jets is something that's zero dimensional. And that makes sense because if I'm kind of zooming out, all I see is a single quark or gluon. But then, as I told you, there's this ultra early breezy splitting evolution, which tells you that as I go down in scale, I emit more and more radiation. So that means as I'm probing things at a finer, finer resolution scale, I end up seeing more and more degrees of freedom. And the rise uh, with, uh, with uh, distance scale as I go down, sorry, yeah, rise with energy scale as I go down is telling me essentially how uh, fractally does my tree of radiation grow as I go down in scale. And this is precisely the scaling behavior of QCD as incorporated or encapsulated by the ultra early crazy splitting function. So that's kind of remarkable that you take this optimal transport idea and you actually are able to come up with the scaling dimension. However, another thing that you see in this plot is you see that there's a difference between the scaling dimension as seen in this data set, again, real data taken from the CMS experiment, a simulated data set that is real data taken from, sorry, since, uh, synthetic data taken from a simulation of the CMS detector. And then the underlying physics shown in blue, which is the underlying description uh, that was fed into the simulation. So what do I mean by that? This, uh, this generation here is generating quarks and gluons that then hadronize form pions and kaons. Those pions and kaons have to hit the detector. That's this detector element here. And you see that the dimensionality in blue, the kind of dimensionality in theory land is different from the dimensionality in, in orange, the dimensionality that I would infer from my data set. So detector effects are distorting the underlying physics. So if I want to do this data-driven technique, this topic modeling, this weak supervision, I have to account for the detector effects. And so also in 2020, uh, uh, we developed uh, a detector unfolding strategy, a multi-dimensional unbuilt way of doing detector corrections by iterated application of machine learning, machine learned reweighting. And so this is a strategy, which I'm not going to describe here, but then allows me to undo detector corrections, essentially a kind of um, uh, maximum likelihood-ish uh, strategy for figuring out what's the most likely underlying uh, description of the data that I'm seeing, assuming that I have a faithful model of my detector response. And so we have all this stuff all coming together, these, all these developments happening in sequence, and then we had COVID. <laughs> and so even though we had all the ingredients together to do this disentangling of quarks and gluons, and even this optimal transport based technique of trying to analyze the data in some interesting way, uh, yeah, some things happened. Uh, uh, Patrick and Eric uh, grad graduated, got their PhDs. Um, and something else fun happened though, which is that we launched this Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions, really trying to come back to this fusion of, uh, of physics and, and machine learning. And this seemed like a good opportunity uh, to come back and ask this question, okay, now can we finally put the, the AI in ultra early breezy? This 
recursive splitting formula, which we've seen can be tackled with these various data science techniques. We saw momentum sharing in this 2017 work. We saw this angular sharing, um, uh, an angular uh, behavior in this uh, uh, set-based architectures. We saw this ability to uh, infer the coordinates from doing this t SNE projection. We saw this dimensionality coming from this intrinsic dimensionality study that gave you understanding of the splitting. Can we get information about separation of, from, of quarks from, from gluons? Is that possible? So uh, uh, taking Patrick, uh, 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 you know, even after graduating him, collaborating with, uh, with Serhi Krian, who is uh, getting his, uh, well, just got his bachelor's degree from MIT this year. We had all the ingredients and now we can put it together including uh, all my collaborators over the years who are contributing individual ingredients to the story. So I told you about these quark and gluon jets from the strong force. I told you how we can confront them with public collider data. That data, that data has detector distortions, which we can correct using machine learning uh, with this omnifold detector correction strategy. I spent the bulk of my time talking about how you can do this disentangling of quarks and gluons using weak supervision, using set-based classifiers and uh, this topic bottling strategy. So that's that koala reading a book. And then we have this idea of triangulation, which allows us to explore the dimensionality of the spaces of, of in principle, uh, quark and gluon jets separately, at least that's the goal. Plus there's some technical details, which if people want me to answer, I can tell you about like, ways that we actually extracted these reducibility factors in a more robust way, how we determine correlated uncertainties, ways of validating the method. But maybe the, the thing just to take away is once you do this topic modeling and you know the quark fractions of your samples, then the rest is linear algebra in the same way that I said that it was just a linear algebra problem to uh, demix uh, cosmology data relevant for the CMB. And that allows us to study individual quark and gluon uh, 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 properties of which I have infinite backup slides for people who are interested in seeing some properties. Uh, but let me just highlight one, which is the one that I said at the beginning of this talk. Okay, so there's there's a lot on this slide and let me see if I can navigate this uh, through you. Okay, so on the left-hand side, we again have this picture where I'm going to probe the effective dimensionality of my space of jets as a function of scale. At high scales, I have single quarks and gluons. At low scales, I have this more complicated radiation pattern. And I'm plotting the effective dimensionality as a function of scale on the um, on the uh, on, on this left-hand plot. Now, the way that this dimensionality is done as a function of scale is kind of interesting. Um, it's a, a fully data-driven way of doing things. So I don't have any coordinates here. Rather, I'm triangulating the space and asking, in this red curve, let's say, imagine that I'm a gluon jet, and I want to know how many other gluon jets are close to me. And as I go out as a function of scale, do the number of neighbors that I have, how quickly does that grow? So if my number of neighbors grows linearly, that means that I'm in a one-dimensional space. If my number of neighbors grows quadratically, that means I'm in a two-dimensional space and so on. And then I average over all those gluons. So again, each gluon I look at, I look at a ball around them, uh, I grow that ball, see how fast it goes and use that to determine the dimensionality. And that dimensionality depends on the choice of scale, uh, which is why you get the scale dependent dimensionality. I can do the same thing if I'm a quark jet in this space. I can take my quark jet, I can make a ball around me, I can see how things change as a function of scale, but I can ask whether I'm a quark jet, whether I have quark neighbors or whether I have gluon neighbors. And so there's three different uh, curves here. There's gluon, gluon, quark, gluon, and quark, quark, basically saying, what's my measure of dimensionality if I'm a gluon looking at the gluons around me, if I'm a quark looking at the gluons around me, that turns out to be the same as a gluon looking at the quarks around me, and then quarks looking at the quarks around me is the fourth category. And then we see these as a function of scale in solid, getting the, the data from, the, uh, from the, the, the CMS experiment and in dashed what you would get from a, uh, a naive uh, a simulation that had artificial quark and gluon labels. And so you can see these curves are a little bit different from each other and we'll see how much different in a moment. This object is totally well-defined. This whole procedure is totally well-defined. That means that I can do a first principles QCD calculation of these curves. These curves have an interesting logarithmic growth, um, and that's actually represented here. Uh, it depends on the strong coupling constant, and then it depends on the sum of the color factors of the two categories. So either the category that I'm using as my starting point or the category that I'm using to see how many neighbors I have. So you sum those things up. And so this is a, a plot that, again, if I can do this quark-gluon separation, 
gets me out to the color factors of QCD, the thing that I've been that I've been hunting. And if you really want to see, did it do a good job? Did it actually figure things out right? Again, I haven't given it any simulation. I haven't given it any first principles knowledge. This whole thing is data driven for this plot, open data processes in this way that I described. But if I take my first principles understanding of what things should look like, and then I take ratios, for example, of these curves that more or less cancels off the logarithmic factor, more or less cancels off the strong coupling constant up to some running effects, then the ratios of the curves look like the following. So if I take the ratio of glue glue to quark quark, the answer should be nine quarters, that is three divided by four thirds. So this is the dashed line, the prediction. In the data, you see this kind of wiggly thing. It's wiggly because there's finite statistics here. And what's extremely satisfying to me is that this wiggly thing is more accurately at the theoretical prediction of nine quarters than the naive thing that you would get from taking simulated uh, information with artificial quark gluon labels. So the artificial quark gluon labels give you a different behavior than this data-driven uh, extracted one. And the data-driven extracted one actually corresponds closer to what you would get from a first principles expectation. Similarly, you can take a combination of glue-glue plus quark-quark and some particular uh, denominator of the quark-gluon cross-ratio, and then you get something that should be one. Indeed, it is one, uh, and it's actually quite satisfying that you get this, uh, this, this behavior seen here. And so I would argue that we've gained new insights into the strong force by fusing these advances in machine learning with insights from quantum field theory. The advances of machine learning are all these various data-driven techniques that I talked to you about. The insights from field theory was which things do I combine together such that the outcome is something that I have a physical interpretation of. Um, and I gave you one example uh, in this plot here. I'm happy to give you other examples for people who are, who are interested. Okay, so let me uh, wrap things up and then, then take questions from you. Um, I started off by trying to present to you this quark gluon conundrum. The way that quark and gluon jets offer a pretty extreme example, uh, but an instructive one for me, where fully supervised learning is just fundamentally ambiguous. These labels don't make sense from a first principles perspective. You need some operational way of making these categories real. Weak supervision is one way of doing that. And merely by the assumption that the categories exist, you can use machine learning to operationally define them. There's still an algorithm behind it, but that's an algorithm that I can apply to data. It's also an algorithm that I can apply to first principles calculations. This is the sense in which I am satisfied that I have an actual definition of quark and gluons that I can work with. And then I did a rapid fire uh, uh, discussion of, of various of things that went into understanding this, uh, uh, this strong force and you know, the combination of this effort, which I went way too fast through. For me, it says that jet physics has crossed an important threshold where machine learning is now yielding um, insights that go beyond traditional analysis techniques. And so then the hope for both myself, for iFi, and I think for all of you in physics at ML is that as we go into the future, we can now start doing more things that really aren't possible with traditional methods where machine learning gets baked into the type of, of uh, analyses we do. And yet we're still able to get interpretable information uh, at the end of the day. Um, so with that, uh, let me stop here and, uh, and take your questions. Thanks very much. All right, Jesse, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, there are uh, quite a number of folks still out there. If you have questions for Jesse, please raise your hand or post it in the chat. I'd encourage you to consider raising your hand though and asking it, asking it live, even just unmute yourself. Yeah, Eva. Hi, Jesse, great talk. Um, thank you for that. I have a possibly a very silly question, but um, it was intriguing how, you know, it was doing this classification and, and it was also getting something about the geometry, right? Um, you had this angular coordinate and all of that. Um, I heard about some case, which may be well known to experts about trying to classify just two uh, spheres that are inside each other, one is inside the other. And, you know, it trains on that and it gets it right um, kind of generically, but there there's a dense set of angles where in fact it gets a completely wrong meaning. It didn't literally learn that the radius is the thing that defines it. Um, so it kind of, in some sense, gets it right. It doesn't overfit in the traditional sense. Um, but at the same time, it didn't really get the geometrical point. I'm wondering if that has any um, role in the kind of thing you were talking about, because it sounded amazing that it understood the point, so to speak, uh, if that's the statement. Yeah, so um, this technique, when I said that, um, uh, let's see, uh, where, where, where did I, where did I, well, let me, let me show that. So, so don't your jet topics depend on the choice of jet features? 
and that I could leverage weak supervision. This assumes that the weakly supervised method that I'm using actually has the correct science in it. So if I'm doing something where I have a, uh, uh, an architecture that, for example, has the incorrect topology, it doesn't know that certain things are, are, are uh, identified or there's just regions of phase space that it can't ever access, then you get bad answers. Um, and so I did a bit of a sleight of hand here. Um, so what I said was, uh, I said that, uh, well, let's see if I can bring it up. I said that I, I was using these set-based strategies uh, to, to do this decomposition. But actually, if you really do this, the exact equation that I have on this, on this page, you actually don't get the right information. You actually get the wrong behavior because uh, quarks and gluons aren't able to be separated out as much as they should be. So it was actually important that we did a relaxation of this in order to make sure that I got the, 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 the correct science at play. So let me see if I can uh, show you what this looks like. Okay, so um, let's see, can I zoom in on this? I can't zoom in on this. So this orange curve here is showing my weak supervision using a machine learning architecture that's doing the best it can for separation. So that's what's shown in, in orange. And so you see very good separation between the, um, uh, basically the category is quark and gluon, which is what you want. However, if I use a restricted architecture, one that doesn't know about all the information, um, in particular, this, the cyan curve uh, is an interesting one because this is one that's not using all the information. I don't get maximal separability. And in fact, what I get is I get the complete wrong definition of what I mean by quark and gluon if I use that one that doesn't have the full information. And I would similarly get a bad answer if I were using one that had, for example, the wrong topology. <laughs> What's interesting about the cyan one though, which is, like even more delightful for me is that this is one that had limited information, but had limited information in a way that I could predict from first principles. That is, I, I could predict from first principles that it was going to do a bad job. And the degree to which it was going to do a bad job is represented by this dash black curve. So this is a case where it didn't have the complete information. It was doing the wrong thing, but I could analytically understand why it was doing the wrong thing. And in fact, we use this as a cross check of our method to make sure we were doing the right thing by making sure that it, in the case where it should not have worked, it did not work, and it did not work in the way that was predicted, if that makes sense. So the, the answer to, to your question from Ybor is like, oh my God, it's amazing that I got the right geometry, the one that was anticipated, the one that was predicted. Yeah, but I had to make sure that my weak supervision had the right um, assumptions baked into it so that it actually had a chance of doing the separa separation the right way. And if I didn't have that correct, then it would have gotten the wrong answer. And I would not have had that relatively good agreement with theory. So, so okay. there, there is something non-trivial about this and it does require domain knowledge to figure out how do you build a classifier that actually separates things out the right way. Garden variety stuff doesn't actually work out of the box. Okay, great, thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm curious if that's also the answer for this silly sphere example, but I'll, I'll mm. look that up with you. Mm. Okay. So are there other questions for Jesse out there? Um, Jesse, in this color ratio plot towards the end, I was actually, uh, you made this point that the, that the nine, the nine fourths was much better modeled by the ML technique than Pythia. What, is it known <laughs> physics wise, why it's sort of falling, why Pythia is doing so poorly here, or is it, uh, so, so I, I don't want to say that Pythia is doing poorly. Um, I don't yeah. know if I have a backup slide that has it. So Pythia actually does a reasonably good job of modeling the data as you see it. <laughs> It's the question of whether the underlying labels that are inside of Pythia, which are fake, yes. which were also the labels that people have been using when they're trying to do uh, full supervision, uh, whether those correspond to anything that's actually what's going on. So, so basically what this is saying is that saying that the physics seems to be right. I, I don't have this curve in backup, but we actually applied Pythia onto, we did apply this, uh, this topic modeling onto Pythia itself. And actually it looks very similar to what you see in the open data. So this is not a statement that Pythia is modeling the physics wrong. That's not mm -hmm. what I'm saying. I'm saying mm -hmm. it actually modeling the physics quite well. It's that the artificial labels that Pythia is using for that modeling. Yes, are the wrong labels. Are, are, are the wrong labels. Good. And that the quark and gluon labels coming Good. from Pythia are not actually what we really should be thinking about what quarks and gluons are. Which, which is precisely uh, so, your so this, this, Which is precisely my point, that I can have a really good, yeah. powerful generative model, but the yeah. internals of that generative model are ambiguous because the only way you're validating that generative model is on the output. 
But now with this data-driven techniques, we can actually now come up with labels that are sensible. And it's very satisfying to me that the sensible labels actually give you something that is theoretically better behaved than what you would have gotten from the naive labels. Good. That makes sense. I, th I think that does make sense. So I think you're saying that that pithy, pithy is good, but pith, pithy is doing the right thing with the wrong labels. But it can't help the fact that it was using the wrong the, the, the labels that weren't the correct data driven labels. Um, right. Well, it's not the wrong labels. It is a, it is a perfectly fine definition. You could use that as a definition. It's just one yes. that I do not know how to I do not know how to define that from first principles. So I, I need something that I, I can apply I in a quantum field theory calculation, and I cannot do a computation of what pithy is definition of anything is. Um, and I think this is an interesting um, uh, example for any of us who are thinking about generative modeling. Is the internals of the generative model, they may have approximate interpretable uh, 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 meaning to them, but does that correspond to what you would have get, gotten from a fully data-driven one where you just looked at the output of the generative model and not at the internals? And this is at least uh, an example where the output is more sensible than the than you know the behind the scenes sausage, which 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 is again very satisfying for me and, and helps me sleep well at night. And uh, and after giving this talk, you know, I don't need to give any more quark and gluon talks. Now I know what I'm talking about, <laughs> and I I, don't, I, feel, I no longer feel the feel the need to apologize when I talk about these categories. Right, and in some sense, I mean, I think when you talked at the beginning about about. Uh... Patrick and Eric coming into your office in 2017. This was the central question that you didn't know how to how to even get at or define. Um, I mean, I guess one technical question I had you 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 raised this you raised this point about that the people were sort of asking uh, on the follow up of this work. Aren't you just shoving the ambiguity into the definitions of a uh, the, the choices of a and b these jet features? Do I understand correctly that sort of sort of the point of this koala technique is to if you're making good assumptions and things are unbiased appropriately. Uh, the choice of A and B as you move towards the optimal classifier just doesn't doesn't have, any choice of A and B will move you towards the right optimal classifier. So it doesn't um, it doesn't matter which one you use. Is that right? Right. So there, there's 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 ambiguity here um, uh, in what mixtures A and B exactly. I'm using, what jet features that I'm using. Yeah. But in the asymptotic limit, assuming that yeah. this assumption is true, then um, then uh, it doesn't matter. That, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yes, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, and um, so then you could say, well, this assumption is false. <laughs> OK, but now I can put numbers to it. So what does it mean for this assumption to be false? This procedure outputs, if you give it two mixtures, A and B, it gives you two topics, which you can call them quark and gluon in quotes, if you like. Now, let's say I give you three mixtures, A, B, C. And then the question is now a, a numerical one, how well are those three mixtures, now with error bars, how well are those three mixtures described just by two underlying elements? Or do you really need a third one? And that's the next step for this whole procedure is now saying, okay, now let me put numbers to my assumptions. So mm -hmm. I, under this assumption, what I've done is well-defined. Now you can yes. question the assumption and now put numbers to it. And then you're gonna get an answer that says, okay, now this is the, the ambiguity in my assumption about the separation into categories. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. becomes again a it now becomes a scientific question once you have a a, a rigorous definition. Right, 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 right. And, and based on how the numbers turn out, you can just examine the validity <laughs> of the assumption. Um, That's right. And and yeah. and uh, I think given that these categories are ones that are are uh, that seem to be useful, the hope is that you know things are quarkish up to a certain percentage. And then to really close the loop, you'd be able to say, oh, by the way, here's my first principle calculation of the deviation of quark and gluon as being the underlying categories and being able to say, you know, it's an alpha S suppressed effect or, or suppressed by, by, by running coupling or whatever, whatever it is, whatever the suppression is, you'd like to be able to know, oh, this is how accurate my assumption is and be able to put a number as well as a calculation to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent, thanks. I have more questions, but I'm sure there are others. Yasmin. Uh, hi, Jesse. Uh, maybe could you say a bit more about um, this this slide actually here and the few surrounding it, how it's even possible, I kind of missed how it's even possible to recover the two distributions from the mixture. Um, this this, 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 this one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give more okay. insight into why this is even possible. Uh, and is it, uh, yeah, if I have more, uh, more distributions involved, can I still do yep. this? Yeah, good. Um, okay, so um, let's look at this formula here. So 
this formula is saying the quark distribution, whatever I mean by it, is the A distribution minus some number kappa uh, times the B distribution. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say A is quark enriched, B is quark deficient, therefore it's gluon enriched. A has a little bit of gluon in it, B has a little bit of gluon in it, or a lot more gluon in it. Let me pull out as much gluon, so that's subtracting off gluon, subtracting off gluon, subtracting off gluons as I increase this kappa bigger, bigger, bigger. I'm also subtracting off some quarks, but if the A is quark enriched relative to B, then by the time all the gluons are gone, I'll be left with just quarks. And then the question is, well, where do I stop? I stop at the point where there is some phase space point where the probability hits zero. Because if I tried to subtract off more, then the probability would become negative, which of course we can't have negative probabilities. So again, if I have this asymmetric mixtures, I subtract them from each other to the point where one of the categories vanishes, so basically gluon vanishes, and then the remainder is quark. And then I renormalize by this one minus kappa to recover something that's a normalized density. Now this assumes that there is a phase space configuration uh, for which things are uniquely quark. So let me give you an example um, in the natural language processing world. So if I say the word model, am I a physicist or am I a machine learning expert if I say the word model? If I say the word model building, that's something that's used by the physics community that's also used by the machine learning community. But if I say I am doing model building for physics beyond the standard model, you're pretty sure that if I say the word physics beyond the standard model that I am a physicist and there's no ambiguity, whereas if I say, you know, I'm doing model building using, I don't know, convolutional neural networks, and you're more likely coming from the machine learning community. That is, there's key words that are never uttered by the other category. Of course, this, <laughs> this is a meeting place where we're using the same vocabularies, but I can have the pure physicist. The pure physicist would not know what a convolutional neural network was, and the pure machine learning person would have no idea what a beyond the standard model model was. Okay. So you assume that there's some phase space point, some configuration that defines uniquely what it means to be not in that category. And that allows you then to divide the complement as the other, and you can do the same thing in, in, in reverse. Now, at some level, I almost see this as like the meaning of what it means to be a category. Like, uh, you know, a category, there must be something unique about that category or things drawn from that category that's so unique that kind of in some sense defines that category. If that doesn't exist, then there's always this question of I can always do this demixing. So I would even argue that if you have, you know, you know, the, the, the other example of, you know, cat lovers and dog lovers or cats and dogs, you know, for image segmentation, image uh, classification, like if you say I have a naive notion of cat, a naive notion of dog, we should still do this demixing and like push things away such that there is like the ideal cat category, the ideal dog category, where there is some image within that category that is so uniquely a cat that no one would uh, accuse it of being a dog and vice versa. And that in fact, I would almost argue that we should be doing this all the time, this demixing, to have pure categories where there's some element of that category which is unique to it. The surprise though, is that you can do this even when you have mixtures. So here for this result, I'm looking at forward jets. It's covering the whole range of charge multiplicities. I have central jets. It's covering the whole range of this. And yet, if you look closely at these histograms, the blue histogram has a zero here. The red histogram has a zero here. There is something when I'm doing this thing mixing where I'm, I'm talking about having uh, uh, elements which are unique to that one uh, uh, category. And then you bootstrap the rest back out to figure out what's going on. Um, now, you would, might say, wait a second, this seems really delicate because it seems like this now depends on being able to identify the rarest elements of your category. And that is and indeed one of the things that we had to resolve, which is that if you're doing a rock curve separation between your mixtures, indeed this ability to do the separation is sensitive to exactly the endpoints of this rock curve. And in fact, the slopes of the endpoints of the rock curve of mixed classifier are the kappa factors that you need to learn. And so how do you extract that when the number of exemplars that you have at the, at the edge of the rock curve is, is small. And that was a statistics problem that Sarah, figured out a reasonable solution to. But this ability to separate two categories, you can always do this demixing. And then the thing that, that, that came from this, um, uh, this uh, I guess, University of Michigan, I forget the other institution, their, their group, was showing you how you do that then, that subtraction in, um, for multiple things, where basically you're trying to figure out ways of doing the subtraction, such that even if you have 27 categories, you're still able to find uh, the, uh, uh, the, the pure categories for, for each of those elements. And it's a somewhat non-trivial procedure. 
that's quite statistically delicate. Um, the two category case is the one that's the easiest to explain and also the one that happens to be relevant for, for, for here, but you can do that same subtraction uh, for multiple categories. And I'll, I, I'll, I'll post this uh, talk and then the link to that paper will be in there. Does that answer Thank your question, you. Alan? Yeah. Yes, that's super helpful. So if, if I yeah. understand, just to reiterate, uh, this, the ability to extract uh, these, the quark and gluon distributions, it does depend on like the X space that you're using this, um, Feature. Yeah. So uh, had it been kind of maybe a lower dimensional space where there does not exist some X for which P quark, you know, is greater than zero and P gluon is zero, you could not have done something like this. You're exactly right. And in fact, this example that I was saying before, we artificially did that. We artificially reduced the X space to something where we knew what the answer was. It doesn't work, but it doesn't work in a way that I can calculate from first principles. And that was the way that we cross-checked what we did. Um, but you're absolutely right. And you know the, the the point that you're making that it depends on the features. Um, this, in some sense, gives you a definition also about how much information do you need. You need enough information in your feature space such that you can find these unique elements of the of, of the category that tells you kind of yeah. If, if that at that, least that's that's what I would advocate for is something along those lines. You know when you should cut off your feature space. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Other questions for Jesse. I'll ask one while maybe, well, maybe uh, more are coming in. Um, we know a lot about QCD, um, but you're emphasizing all of the aspects of, of the problem that are, are hard, particularly from an experimental and a, and a data perspective. Uh, but you have this beautiful picture of this interpretable ML in this latent space, uh, you know, recovering and focusing in on exactly the parts that the altarelli parisi equation would, would tell you to do. Um, mm -hmm. Are there efforts in the ML for Jets community to try to, so if you'd like, I mean, if you didn't know this formula, uh, the ML might have told you exactly this sort of d theta over theta, dz over z dependence if you had enough precision and you might have written down a formula like this and then gone and asked what in the theory would have mm -hmm. given rise to this. Mm -hmm. but, but here you're recovering mm -hmm. a known result. Are there efforts to try to sort of generate new conjectures for QCD in a sense so that you might then go and, uh, um, Proof yeah, so, so I'm not, so that, that's, that's exactly where this stuff is going, right? Yeah. Like all, all this stuff, this is a case where this is, um, this was done with strong supervision, this particular plot, but you'd also do it in the context of weak supervision um, to ask if you have a machine learning that's learning some interesting latent representation, can you use that to, to learn something about your data set yeah. uh, or learn something about the strong force or, yeah. And um, I'm not aware of, uh, well, there are definitely efforts to try to uh, interpret uh, uh, our, our work like in, in a first principles understanding. So I think Daniel Whiteson, I saw his face on here. So he and I have collaborated on um, uh, trying to interpret the output of a neural network in terms of interpretable structures. But really what you're asking for is, can we have something that we could learn that um, you know, might become the next foundational principle? Yeah. And there are baby steps in this direction. So for example, um, some folks on here have, have worked on uh, trying to say, if I give you a, a, a data set, can you find what symmetries that data set has? Like that's, that you can phrase as a machine learning problem. Um, one thing you could do is say, I have a restricted generative model, a generative model where I'm trying to bottleneck things in some way. Can I find a lower dimensional representation of that higher dimensional uh, space? That would be like a type of manifold learning. You try to do that. The, the challenge that I have been, well, <laughs> the reason why I haven't gotten to work on that yet is be, was more just saying in the cases that I understand, where I think I know what's going on, can I make sure that I can reproduce those first? This is one example. Other examples that I've tried to do this on haven't quite worked out the way that I wanted to. And so that's, that's what's, what's given me caution in terms of you know, just saying, hey, we have these tools, let's just take the mountain yeah. of open data yeah. and just apply yeah. these techniques directly to it. It's like, well, do I have enough examples where I'm confident in the output so that I can really say if I discover something um, that, it's, that it's really there. Uh, the simplest example that people would like to apply this to is for anomaly detection, where you're trying to discover new particles in your data set and say your generative model actually has some resonance that you wanna do by sifting through data in some way. And when I've tried to apply these techniques in that context, uh, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and I don't understand why. And until I understand that, that's a caution that I have for deploying these things in the wild. 
but at yeah, least we so. have these case studies which, which give me confidence that we're going in the right direction. And I would advocate for these things kind of being paired as we go as we go forward. Uh, no, I think I think I appreciate the point. And and I guess in some sense you're saying that in, in, until you uh, have really robust control and understanding over the ML across many examples, you would, if the ML is pointing in a direction, you'd be want to be sure that it's doing it in a robust way before you chase a rabbit hole down that direction. Uh, that, that, yeah. That's right. And also understanding the failure, failure mode. So, uh, so yeah, exactly. Eva brought up an interesting failure mode where yeah, you yeah. say, just here's an example that doesn't work. And until you, yeah. until you well, as you start having that, that, that catalog of, of, of examples, you want to make sure yeah. you have solutions such that you have, um, yeah, w ways when you, if you were to encounter that in an unknown yeah. situation that you would know how to respond. But I think it's the way this is going. I'm not aware of any other ones at the moment, but um, yeah. this is definitely yeah, something on, on my mind. Yeah. It, it has overlap, uh, for instance, with this with this meeting on math and ML at Harvard mm -hmm. last month that was sort of uh, inspired in part by this DeepMind paper. But I mean, I guess something that's different, something that's similar here is that in two cases, you have you have a sharp equation here, this uh, Altarelli Parisi story, and there's a there was a sharp equation conjectured in this paper that was then proven as a theorem that was just like, honest to God, here's an equation that's true. And, uh, but I guess the difference is, is that in, in the math cases, you have extremely robust features because the thing that you're training on is literally a topical, topological invariant of some structure. There's in some sense, no noise. It's a rigorous feature that allows you to differentiate between right. classes. And I think, I mean, would you say that part of the issue here uh, in, 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 in Getting new QCD results is sort of the the noise and mess intrinsic to the story, as opposed to like this really clean math story. Right, right. So if I another way of asking this is if I, if I didn't know that the correct answer was nine quarters, but I look at this yeah. solid curve with all its wiggles and noise. I I don't have error bars on this, but the the, the yeah. statistical error bars are basically the size of these wiggles. <laughs> would yeah. I say nine quarters or would I say some other number? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, would exactly. I be able to say like, oh, this is the color ratio, like, and then use this to infer that, for example, I have an SU3 gauge theory and it's a triplet and, a, and an octet. Like, I, I, this is not yet at that level of accuracy, um, and that's also part of my caution to drawing, you know, too too strong of a, of a conclusion from it. Um, but I, I don't think that it's necessarily impossible um, to to do, to do that. Uh, and when you see these case studies that, that work in the way that you expect them to, that yeah. gives you some confidence that you should continue going. And each year, year after year, it gets more and more robust. And I couldn't believe uh, when we made this plot for the first time that it looked even remotely right. Um, because uh, let me just show this one last thing. Um, like here, um, these are the, 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 the quark fractions that you actually extract. One sample is like, uh, like so 70 well first of all there's a correlated uncertainty here which is very interesting uh and then like one is 70 percent, and the other one is 56 percent. that's not that much dynamic range these things look really similar and yet nevertheless with that very small difference you're able to do this subtraction accurately enough with the data sample that we had to, to show the plot that i showed obviously with with large statistical uncertainties um so even so, so then it becomes well if I could just push the purity of this a little bit better, so that I actually can leverage more of my more of my my, my stats, that that's another strategy that I could use uh, in order to get more robust results. Is just finding uh, more clever ways of slicing and dicing my data, uh, so that I can decrease some of the the error bars, and that maybe give me more confidence in drawing conclusions. That's another uh, way one could go. But you're absolutely right; it's different than the than the math example because this is noisy data. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's there's sampling bias in the math story, but given a sample, you can compute exact features that are rigorous. Um, yeah, there's, yeah. So I'm going to stop because there's questions coming in in the chat, and I'll, maybe it's good to um, if you could take a look at those. If people um, do, do you want me to read them out? Yeah. So that'd be great. Uh, so, so yeah. So, so Jan asking about the consequences for what I just showed um, for the future prospects for the development of of jet tagging methods. So I'm an expert in jet tagging. Quark and Gluon, by the way, is like the hello world of jet tagging. There's a whole universe of different tagging strategies that people are doing. Um, so not up to speed with all the developments in Atlas CMS, also LATV is doing stuff, but I'm under the impression that many taggers currently use supervised learning and thus may depend on whatever labels the generative model is using internally. And the answer is yes. And what are the consequences? If you have trustable generative models, then it's not an issue. You apply the same thing to your real data. You apply the same thing to your generative model. If your generative model has parameters that you're trying to fit, you can just do an inference task of trying to figure out the parameters of that generative model. And that's totally fine if you trust your generative model. 
if you are concerned about uncertainties in your generative model, either uncertainty is having to do with the detector, or what I care more about is uncertainties having to do with when I'm doing a theory calculation, I only do that theory calculation to a certain accuracy. So there's uncalculated terms that I need to know. If my generative model doesn't have those higher order effects in there, then it could just be wrong. Uh, and so if it's wrong, what am I actually doing when I'm trying to do inference? And this shows up, for example, when people talk about measuring the top quark at colliders and, and arguments about what the meaning of the top quark mass is, because the mass parameter is something in the Lagrangian of, uh, of the standard model, but it's also a parameter in a Monte Carlo event generator. What do we even mean by that? Can we put those things back together? And people have talked about ways of, of calibrating generators. But what I would caution with is that anytime you're using these supervised learning taggers, you have to be very careful about what you mean by them. And if you just are very honest, and say my operational definition of, let's say, a quark jet is the thing that gives me an output value of one as trained on Pythia, this particular version on this particular sample, then you're totally fine. Like this, this training initialization is just a function. That's perfectly fine. And then you have to decide for yourself how to assign systematic uncertainties to the fact that you could have made different choices. Um, but we just have to acknowledge that and, and acknowledge the fact that, as, I was, as uh, I, I was saying, and this, again, it's totally true, uh, nothing has changed from my, my opinion, uh, that, uh, that what we mean by jets is, or, or flavors of jets, is a phase-based region as defined by an unambiguous hadronic judicial cross-section measurement that yields an enriched sample of whatever object as interpreted by suitable but fundamentally ambiguous criteria. And like, that is the real meaning. And so... This phase phase region that yields an enriched sample, that's what you would call a control region or a calibration region. And then uh, the interpretation of that via some part-time level intuition is you know, what you would get from an event generator. So that's one way of solving it. This weak supervision is an alternate way of, 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 of solving it. Um, but as long as we're, we're honest about that, I don't see a problem. We just have to understand those limitations. Um, and then uh, uh, another question that, that uh, Michael said is, uh, if I'm concerned by topological features, have you considered using topological data analysis rather than TSNE? So I should say that TSNE, we only did this for, uh, for, uh, uh, for visualization purposes, just to see what was coming out. The actual science um, behind this was uh, this uh, correlation dimension, which has a, a, a rigorous formulation. Um, but with this topological thing, I guess where I would start to worry about topology would be making sure that I understood the topology of, um, of the ground metric that I would use in my optimal transport. So I, I, I could give a whole hour talk about optimal transport. Optimal transport depends on your choice of ground measure. And I would say that we have not considered as much as we should topology issues when it comes to the, to the, the ground transportation um, metrics. So that's something that we definitely need to think about. But for TSNE, that was just a particular visualization strategy. We never actually used TSNE uh, as an, a, a, other than, than uh, for this display purpose. So thanks for the questions. Any other questions for Jesse? Maybe I'll ask one last high level question to cap cap it off. Uh, yeah. I think part of the whole thing that we think in this at iFi is that uh, when we move in this sort of new direction, it can affect how we think about problems and approach problems in our conventional field. Mm -hmm. In some sense, your whole talk was sort of about the trajectory of that for you. Um, but if mm -hmm. you could go back to 2017, Jesse Thaler and, you know, Yes. Tell yourself one thing. What has been sort of the biggest surprise in terms of how you have changed how you think about QCD problems or, or strong force problems? Yeah. So if I if I go back to this room, so the first the first <laughs> thing that I would say, uh, which I already knew at this time, was follow the data and think about what access to information you actually have. So that's one thing I would say is follow the data. And the other thing I would tell myself is that this concern or this question should not be ignored. So when people talk about in the AI world, like the concerns about the robot apocalypse, and sometimes we laugh, oh, you know, that's overblowing or overhyping things. I think we need to listen to those concerns, but not listen to those concerns in the way that they're formulated, which is often like the way that I formulate this, like just angry. What do you mean by quarks and gluons? Or, you know, how can I trust an, an AI uh, that's driving a self-driving car? How could we ever uh, put morality into that? and rather take that as a question as saying, okay, that question, it has validity. Can you turn that into an equation? Can you turn that concern into an equation? Can you turn that question into an equation to be solved? 
And what do you mean by quarks and gluons? The definite, the answer to that question is, is like, what do you mean by quarks and gluons? And this is what I came to realize. The answer to that question whoops, of quarks and gluons is a quark and gluon means that I can make a mixed sample that can be combined in this way. This is what it means to have quarks and gluons as a category. This is the equation that's behind that. Then you take that equation and you go to the machine learning literature and you and you say, oh my God, people have talked about all sorts of mixture models. This is incredible. I can just uh, <laughs> leverage this whole toolkit of blind source separation and everything. Um, but it was phrasing that in an equation form. And so instead of using words to attack something, instead try to turn it into an equation and ask, is that equation rigorous? And I've been surprised how often when I've had a concern, actually there's a, an equation form of it, which then can be tackled using machine learning. And that machine that you can use machine learning in this case to confront your concerns about what machine learning is doing. And so now I've totally actually become now happy with full supervision. Why am I happy with full supervision versus weak supervision? Or at least this version of weak supervision is because the equations on these two slides are the same. Like whether I'm doing fully supervised or this, this mixed run, it's the same formulation. You just have to interpret it in a slightly different way. But then I was concerned that MSE was all wrong or binary cross entropy was all wrong. No, 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 <laughs> it's still fine. You just have to be concerned about, about the interpretation. So those are the two things, follow the data and turn your questions into equations. Great bullet points for uh, many, many different fields. Uh, all right. Well, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, thanks to everyone that stuck around for so many questions. And thanks to uh, everyone else that was here a little earlier. Uh, Jesse, that was wonderful. Right. We appreciate it. And uh, hope to see as many people as possible uh, interacting uh, uh, in August. Thanks. Right. Thanks.